Because if I need them, I'm lost. Oh, okay, there my phone is. Okay, so I had to make sure I know because I had to let them know if I have to leave anything. But we're going to go on and get started uh, this evening, and hopefully Belinda will be in in a moment. If not, then we're just going to press on. So let's start. We're going to open with a uh, prayer. Uh, and before that, let me let you know we're at uh, Jeremiah chapter 19. So Jeremiah chapter 19 is where we are. So, but we're going to open up with prayer and then. On. So let us pray. Lord God, we come to you this evening trying a new thing. Isaiah spoke to us about holding on to the old things, but embracing the new things as well. Mm. So Lord, here we are, embracing this new thing, embracing this new technology, embracing the way that teaching and preaching can be presented to your people, Lord. Embracing this new way that we as preachers and teachers can reach your people. And Lord, for this, we are grateful. Yes. Lord God, we pray for those who are here physically this evening, and we pray for those who are with us virtually as well. We pray, Lord, for health and strength, for healing and mending, for peace and love. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness. We ask that you forgive us for all sins that we have committed since the last time we communed with you. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and shut in, for those who are incarcerated and without homes, and for those who are lost and have strayed away from your love, your provision, and your protection. Lord, we pray that as we study your prophet Jeremiah this evening, that we receive the wisdom and knowledge that he has for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So again, we are on chapter 19, and we will begin by reading, actually, chapter 19, uh, is only about 15 verses and it goes into Jeremiah chapter 20 verses 1 through 6. So we will be reading 19 through 20, 1 through 6 because they go together. I didn't want to wait until next week because it's a continuation that's like so closely with that. So I just want to break that up. So what I am going to do is if everybody's ready, I'm just going to read the entire thing. Unless I have some volunteers. Let's do some volunteers this evening. I think we're close enough to that. Y'all in agreement with that? Y'all like mm -hmm. that? Y'all like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get y'all participation in it. So I'm going to ask for like, let's just say volunteers. For someone to read, let's say, uh, begin at chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. And then... Uh, well, let's see, since it's, well, gee, yeah, verses one through six, let's do that. And then we'll have someone to read verses uh, seven through 13. Okay. So verse one through six, then seven through 13, and then the final reader will read from 14 uh, on through 20, verse number six. So the first person that they will read through verse number six. Thus says the Lord. Go buy a potter's earthenware, glass, and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry of the pasture gate, and proclaim there the words that I tell you. You shall say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place, that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known. And because they have filled this place with the bloods of innocent and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, 
nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no more be called Tophet, mm -hmm. or the valley of the son of Hannah, but the valley of slaughter. And in this place I will make void the plains of Judah and Jerusalem, and will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth. Okay, good. Thank you. Second volunteer, you want to read verses 8 through 13. Or let's say 8 through 15. Somebody. Anybody. And I will make the city of Hall a thing to be his home. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all the his disaster. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And all shall eat the flesh of their neighbors and the and the seed, and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. Then you shall break the jug in the sight of those who go with you, and shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So will I break this people and this city as one breaks potter's vessels, so that it can never be mended. In puppy. They shall bury until there is no more room to bury. Thus will I do this to this place, says the Lord, and to its inhabitants, making the city a city like temple. Am I saying that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the house of Jerusalem and the houses of the king of Judah shall be defiled and like the place of Tophet. And now all the houses are going through roofs, offerings have been made to the whole host of heaven and lavation, lavation have been poured out to other gods. When Jeremiah came from Tophet, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, he stood in the, the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I am now bringing upon the city, upon this town and all the disaster that I have pronounced against it because they have stiffened their necks refusing to hear my words. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And one more to read chapter 20 verses 1 through 6. Chapter 2. Now Asher, the son of Nimrod the priest, who was chief officer in the house of Jehovah, heard Jeremiah prophesizing these things. Then Asher, Zechariah, mm -hmm. smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper gate of Gideon, which was in the house of Jehovah. And it came to pass on the morrow that Asher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Jeremiah 20. Then, <laughs> then said Jeremiah unto him, Jehovah hath not called thy name Asher. But you want to imagine you listening? That's possible. <laughs> but thus <laughs> say Jehovah, behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I will give all the riches of this city and all the gains thereof and all the precious things thereof. Yea, all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give unto the hands of their enemies. And they shall make them a prey and take them and carry them to Babylon. And now Pastor and all that dwell in thy house shall go into captivity. And thou shalt come to Babylon and there thou shalt die. And there shalt thou be buried. Thou and all the thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied also. Thank 
you. Thank all of you for volunteering and reading this time. Yay. Thank you all. That was wonderful. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Me, what she said, you know, she asked something. But mine says terror all around. What is right. It? We're going to do, we're going to get there. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that just translated different. Yeah. Word. That oh, word she did, she oh, said, it just means that that's what it was. This guy's going to end up being a terror. He's going to be He's going to be just as worse as um, one of those like bad kings. So he, and he's a priest. So then we had all those officials, the kings, the uh, princes with the P R I N C E S, not E S S E S, not a women, but the men princes and the officials and all that. Remember how they were oppressing the people and how bad that they were doing? He's, he, he's just as worse as what they are. Mm -hmm. So he changed his name. Uh, you remember how God changed his people's names? So he, and you remember God was talking through Jeremiah. So he changed this man's name from Pasher to Mega, whatever. We're going to show it up there in the end, uh, the whole name. Because my Bible says it's yours, Tara, all around. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that. She has the, the part that's not translated mm -hmm. yet. Okay. So, but this passage that we just read is a continuous, you know, it's in prose. The beginning of it is in prose. Uh, with the literary unit consisting of this include chapters 18, 19, and 20. So these three units are all built around the potter's thing. Remember we talked about, about the potter uh, last week. Um, Jeremiah went over to the potter's house. Mm -hmm. So and he's watched the potter while he's working. It's considered one of Jeremiah's confessions. And if you all can remember, Jeremiah's confessions, uh, Jeremiah's confessions are brief self-revelations where he lays bare some of his own deep uh, questions and intimate feelings. So Jeremiah gets into himself. And a lot of those times it was when he had been praying for his people and praying for his people and praying for his people. Remember, he prayed three times, deep prayer. And God told him the first time, stop praying for them. They're not listening. You know, they're not listening to you anyway. The second time, he's praying for them. He's pleading with God. Let's save these people. And God is all the time sending that army from the north, Babylon, on their way. They're on their way. So they continue, you know, and Jeremiah continued to ask him, please help them. Lord, stop this, you know, this wrath that you're going to put on them. Lord, is there anything else that we can do, you know, and, and all that. So Jeremiah was doing that. He was constantly praying for the people. Now, that's the second time. And God told him the first time, stop praying for those folks. I done gave up on it. Remember, God turned his back on him. He was through with him. So he prayed the first time and God and, and, and pleaded. And God said, just stop. Did the second time. Same thing. Just like you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, you think about all that. So, and he would turn and God said, Jeremiah, there's no point. I've turned my back on you. Mm -hmm. You may as well stop. You know, they will not repent. They, re they refuse to repent. That was the reason. So God is like, there's no point in this. So the third time, Jeremiah prayed again. And so he just could not stop praying for his people because he understood the wrath that was coming their way. He knew how bad it was going to be. And so he continually prayed, you know, for the people. And God is telling him all the time, you're just wasting your time. Mm -hmm. There's no point. They're not listening. They won't recognize me for who I am. They want to continue to worship the idol. They want to continue to worship all those other deities that they were worshiping and not me. So, and he's given them time after time after time after time to repent, and they did not. So that's where that's why he's uh, you know, that's where we're at right now. That's that's why when Jer Jer Jeremiah would do these confessions, he did several confessions. Jeremiah's confession is where he would get into his feelings. You no, know, one point he got into his feelings so bad he was like, Lord, you know what? You just separate me from them. You know, go on and kill them all. You know, it got just that bad last week when he was doing it. Because at first he was just praying for them. So last week he started praying for himself more, more, more or less. So he was tired, just like God was. He was tired. There's nothing else I can do for them. So this chapter tells how Jeremiah was commanded by God to take an earthenware jar. Uh, and verse number one said, thus says the Lord, go and buy a potter's earthenware jug. And some of your Bible is going to say jar. Some of your Bibles is going to say jug. Some of your Bibles are either going to say wine jar. So, you know, so it just depends on what translation you got. And uh, so he tells him to go and take that potter's earthenware jug and to go outside the parshier's uh, gate 
the, yeah, the posture's gate, and before witnesses, he was to smash the jar. So that's what this chapter has told him to do. But while smashing the jar, he was to announce that Jerusalem would also be smashed beyond repair. Mm -hmm. When you think about a jar, you know, visualize that when you smash that jar, how it shatters into so many pieces and it spreads and it goes all over the place. But it's destroyed. So that is what he's giving them to see a vision of how, you know, Judah or Jerusalem, remember, uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. So that's what he's saying that, that Judah is about to be scattered, shattered. The people are going to be scattered all over the place. They're going to be broken. You know, so and that's what he's trying to give them. That's why he wanted him to visualize it. So he went and he's given it day. And remember, it's full of symbolism, just like Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. So he's giving this, uh, uh, wanting them to see this. So while smashing the jar, he was saying now that Jerusalem will, Jerusalem will be smashed beyond repair. Like he wanted him to see and wanted the people to see that there was no, there was right now at this point in time, you all have been so disrespectful to me that there's nothing I could do for you. So on his return to the city, he's gonna return to that city, he repeated the words of judgment and he was arrested by this priest who is who she read about, Pas Pashur, and his name is Pashur Ben Emmer. Uh P A S H A U R D N B E N in small letters, and then Emer, I begins with the capital letter I M M E R. So when this guy arrested him, this king, this priest, this priest, when he arrested him, because back at that time, priests were high up, you know, they were official. So when he arrested him, they beat him. He had he had Jeremiah beaten, and then he was placed in the stocks. They put him in the stocks. So we're gonna we're gonna see all that. He was released. The following morning, and then uh, and remember back in the past when Jeremiah Jeremiah had been placed in the stocks before he'd been beaten before he'd been put into the cistern or you know cistern is a well uh, W E L L not not the belly of a well mm -hmm. <laughs> the well not that well but no a well you know a cistern he'd been put in that so he went through a lot already all this because he he uh, talked about the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, they his even his he that he was plotted against for death. You no, know, even his kin people, his kin, his kin wanted to kill him because he wouldn't shut up about the Lord. So since all that he he went through a lot already, way before this time when this guy's gonna step in. So then after all that, Jeremiah he, he after he was released the next day, he pronounced judgment against Peshur and prophesied his exile to Babylon, where he would die. And that happened. It, it happens. So now, what I want to do, let's just dive into all that that I just said. Let's just unpack all that just a little bit. So, the earthenware jar is uh, probably a narrow neck. I was trying to find a narrow neck jar. <laughs> a narrow neck water decanter. So, they probably just only use it for water and wine. Because they, they did do wine back then, which was very common during this time. So, uh, y'all, that was a hard picture to find, too, of somebody actually making one uh, the earthenware, the jar like that. So the elders of the people and the priests were to be taken as witnesses. Um, she read that uh, with, at verse number one. The thing about this is that it's hard to imagine that Jeremiah would be able to convince, convince these important people to follow him anywhere. Because remember all the trouble that they've given him before now. These people, your priests, your prophets, your um, kings, you know, princes, they were the ones that were oppressing the Israelites. They were leaders, but they were oppressing the Israelites. So Jeremiah is one that they were behind saying, kill him. Mm -hmm. Kill him. They were the one, they were leading the charge along with, you know, they went to his family. So they're all, you know, shut your brother up. Mm -hmm. Shut your uncle up, you know. So they went to his family. So these are the people that were actually leading the charge. So the people, you know, they got the people all stirred up. So that's why it's kind of, you know, when it's kind of hard to imagine even at this point in time, later on in the game, that Jeremiah would even be able to get these people to follow him. But we also have to remember that God is in all this and God is the one who's giving Jeremiah, telling Jeremiah what to do. So he would make it possible for those people to get up. Remember how it went Cyrus when, when they uh, released the, uh, well, they hadn't did it yet, but we've already read that. <laughs> We're getting there. When they released, when he released the uh, people from finally from uh, exile, 
you know, and he was a pagan guy, a, a pagan king, not God, he was a pagan king. But God, you know, uh, called him or told him to, uh, or led him to let the Israelites go. And that's how they ended up back at home. Because, and remember, the Israelites got all upset because, Lord, why did you let him lead us home? He's, he, he's a pagan king. Why not one of us? But God was showing us in that example that he can use whoever he wants to, whenever he wants to, and for whatever purpose that he had in mind. So, but anyway, so Jeremiah, so that's why it was hard to believe that Jeremiah would be able to get these people, these certain ones, these officials, to follow him anywhere. Because he was only asking for the elders, the uh, the senior priests, and you know, the king, just people like that to follow him. So the location of the Pontchur Gate in ancient Jer Jerusalem is unknown. But I can't tell you exactly where it is. So they can kind of like pinpoint where this Pontchur Gate is. It's probably acquired its name from the fact that potters whose workshops were near the gate dumped their broken vessels. So when they broke, Oh, when they broke, <laughs> they just dumped their broken vessels beyond the gate. But well, they had a certain place, and that was usually considered as the dung gate. When they uh, and and the word dung, they did put that out there too. <laughs> That's what they 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 yeah. You know, we've already did back when we did Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, it was Nehemiah. We did uh, the twelve gates, and we went through all the gates. We went through all of them. So that's one one of them. That's the dung gate. That's how it looks today. If you go to Israel, that's the way that gate looks right now. So uh, uh, the location of it, like I said, is unknown. Uh, at that time, the Pontius Gate is unknown. It probably acquired its name from the fact that, like I said, potters who workshop right there used to just dump their uh, dump their, their uh, broken, uh, anything that didn't work, anything didn't work for them. If it didn't come out right, whatever, if they didn't refix it, they just dumped it. They just used that. And also, she read about the hymnon. So the Hemlin Valley, which is on the south side of the city, was dumped, was the dumping place. So all this is where they dump, they dump stuff. So the Pasha's Gate was also on the south side as well. So it is also the place where you see verses 10 and 11, when you read 10 and 11, it's also the place where uh, all this was performed. So 10 and 11 said, then you shall break the jug in sight of those who are uh, with you and shall say, say the Lord, oh, so I will break this people. I will break this piece. So that, let's just know that the Dung Gate is where they, and and, it, and they are thinking that, that, theologians are thinking that that is also uh, was the place with the, they, start, they changed names of Pasha Gate, but that's the Dung Gate. So if you go to Israel, which we're going to go, we're going to go. <laughs> so get ready for that trip, y'all. Uh, probably in, I know it'll be in February, so that's the best time actually to go, and probably 2025. 2025, not next year, but that's just so close. So probably 2025, uh, we're gonna, you know, probably be trying to integrate. Anyway, there we go. So that'd be about the time. So, uh, but we'll give y'all more details on that, all that, when all that, when it's time for all that. So, and and this is how it looked back at that time. That's the, the exact same gate. Uh, that's just how it originally looked when it was done. It was a little bit different than the one we just looked at. The one we just looked at was the one that had used to know the people in cars. You know, so it's modern. Like I think it was built back in like 1948 when they redid it and stuff. So now, but that's where it looked originally. And you, and you see to the picture, they're carrying stuff that they're throwing away uh, on there. So that's what that is. So the Jerusalem Targum, the Targum is T-A-R-G-U-M. Jerusalem Targum. That's the originally uh, spoken translation of the Hebrew Bible. So that's what that is. It's the original, original spoken translation of the Hebrew Bible. It identified the Pasha's Gate with the Dun Gate. So that's what they. That's where they came up with. This is the same gate. This is the same gate. Because you'll notice when we when we did the gates that they had you know different names. They changed some of the names. The Valley of Ben Hinnom, which she read about, which is also referred to as the Valley of the Hinnom, is known today. It's known today. The name is the Wadi Iraba, uh, R A B A B I. So, and it runs in a <laughs> southern direction on the west side of Jerusalem, and then it turns eastward toward the Wadi Kidron at the southeast corner of the center. 
why y'all telling me all that? Like, why is she telling me all that? That just seems so far. But when you go to Israel, you see some of this stuff. <laughs> I'm just preparing you ahead of time. So, but in this area, in this area, the refuge of the city was burned or it was dumped. So that's another place that they burn in the dump stuff. So in the same way, from time to time, the worship of pagan gods were performed. So that's why they would do some of their some of their uh, worshiping. So Jeremiah, in verse number three, he addresses both the officials, which are the kings, the princes, the priests, and the elders of Judah, and also the people, or the citizens of Jerusalem. But mind you, the actual audience are the elders, um, the priests, and the kings, and the prophets, uh, whom he took with him in verse number one, when it told him to, to take these people with you. And so, like I said, it, you know, you think of these people right here, and it's like, these people would not have went unless God stepped in, and he did. So, um, it was not unusual for Jeremiah or for other prophets to address the nation, even if the immediate audience was a small one. So, even though he's, he's talking to the leader, and they're going to get it back to the people. Because they're going to talk and they're going to talk. And then Jeremiah himself is going to go back. After he's talked to these leaders, you're going to see where he's going to go back and talk to the people. So he's going to talk to the leaders first. He get them out by themselves first. Then he's going to go back and talk to uh, everybody else. In this case, Jeremiah addressed himself to the rulers in which they represented all the people. So he took a small group with him because he couldn't get all the people and take them. But he wanted to talk to all of them, so he started with the rulers. And then Jeremiah was born into a priestly family sometimes around 645 B.C. And he lived through the reign of five kings. So that's where Jeremiah lived through the reign of five kings. The first one was Josiah. And all these kings, you know, that there are kings of Judah, and then we have one governor. So Jeremiah lived through all those kings. And, and you see the second one is Jehoahaz. Yeah, Jehoahaz. He, uh, Jehoahaz, he uh, was at 50, what, 609 B.C., and he was deposed of by Egypt. At this time, they they were trusting Egypt to do things for them. They wanted Egypt to save them. They knew that death was coming. They knew the wrath of God was coming, but they went back to Egypt. Of all people to ask for help, of all people, they ran to Egypt. So, <laughs> and Egypt, yes, we're going to help you out. We're going to help y'all out. We there for y'all. We got y'all. And they stabbed him. They turned their backs on him. And then you had uh, and several, like even Assyria. And Assyria had taken Israel into exile. Totally destroyed Israel, but they went to Israel. I mean, they went to Assyria, even going for help. But then, and uh, you also know with the other king, Jehoiachin, 598, 597 BC, <laughs> Jerusalem, they, that's when they surrendered. And many Israelites were deported to Babylon. And then uh, then they ended up all the way down to the governor. And he was appointed governor of Judah. He was assassinated in 582. And then Jeremiah, that's when Jeremiah went into uh, exile. So uh, even Jeremiah, Jeremiah ended up going into exile you know, back then. So um, Jeremiah, like I said, he brought it to a king, uh, 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 priestly family. So Jeremiah was born into a priestly family. So there was a lot expected, you know, with the priests and all that. So Jeremiah was born into the priestly family. Um, and he, all those kings right there that served under Jeremiah all the way down actually to the governor. They, you know, this is Judah. So you got, these are in the Davidic line. This is the Davidic line. Israel, Israel had kings that if you kill that king right there that's on the on, on the throne, then you can become a king. Some of those kings didn't last a whole day. It was like, if I can be king, I'm going to be king. So that's how Israel, that's the way Israel, the northern kingdom, had began to be uh, operating. This is the southern king. And they all had that one line, the Davidic line, that God had told them that they were going to have. And so uh, that's where all those kings are part of. And as you see, we went all the way down. And, and of course, that's not all the kings. They're just some of them. These are just the ones that reigned during Jeremiah's lifetime. So Jeremiah spoke in the name of the God of Israel and referred to the coming disasters as something that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. She read that. 
in verse number three. So she said, uh, <laughs> Jeremiah spoke and said that the word, the stuff that was going to about to happen, the disaster that was coming, everybody, just your ears, your ears of everyone who hear about it will tingle. You're going to hear something. You're going to feel something. This expression is used elsewhere in the Old Testament when it describes the reaction of people to a, 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 a catastrophe or a disaster or a calamity that was coming their way. First Samuel chapter three, verse number 11 reads, then the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. A disaster was coming their way. And then second Kings chapter 21, verse 12, Read, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such evil that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. So whenever a common disaster was coming their way, you will see that phrase in the Bible. So, and, and those were the two places that that was happening in. And then in verses four and five, the reason, verses number four and five gives us the reason that the common calamity or the common disaster or destruction are given. God's total sovereignty over the people inside the covenant, oh, he had a covenant relationship with them, uh, had been rejected. So they rejected God. They rejected the covenant mm -hmm. that God had between himself and them. All, and, and the main thing that they were doing, we all know, was, was the idol worship. And when they were worshiping those idols, they were doing a lot of things that they should not have been doing. And, and one of the worst things to me is the fact that they were having the uh, prostitutes in the temple, you know, and they were removing the things of God from the temple, and then they were bringing in uh, stuff that they should not have been bringing in into the temple. So just removing the things of God from the temple was bad enough, mm -hmm. but to be bringing in the sinful things that they were bringing in was even worse. The people were sharing their allegiance with other deities. They had forsaken God, and as verse number four states. They had profound displays. It said they had profound displays. And some of your Bibles say that they say, I think hers did, said they made this an alien place. The place had been uh, denationalized so that it could not be recognized as an Israelite. So they're probably talking about a temple, the temple, Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem. They had defiled the temple. So your, your Bible used it and it said a place. The, uh, because they have filled this place, that's at verse number four, because they have filled this place, you know, with the blood of the innocent. So this is the place, or because, and they have profaned, in fact, profound this place by making offerings in it to other gods. Mm -hmm. that, that's the temple that he's talking about. They have defiled God's temple. So um, the people were offering up sacrifices to other gods which neither they nor their ancestors had known. So they were using a lot of, now that's Baal. That, that, that guy right there is considered Baal. He was like the god of fertility and the god of agriculture. You know, so he was like their main god that they were, uh, that they were worshiping. And, and you'll see him in different spots. That's, that's, that's one uh, image you'll see of him. There's another image where, where you know, him standing straight up and he still looks like a cow. But he's standing straight up, you know, and stuff. So they got a couple of images that you'll see of, of Baal. So that's just one image that I put up. So it appears that the people were involved in filling the place with the blood of the innocent. The blood of innocent. Children were being offered in fire as burnt offerings at the high places uh, built for Baal. So Baal is that guy again. And the way Baal is B-A-A-L. But uh, human sacrifices were known in the Middle East, but was condemned in Israel. It was condemned in Israel. And these people knew better, but they had taken on uh, the practices or the religious practices that uh, the uh, people around them, the people in Canaan were doing. So they were just doing what the people were doing. They were just doing what the people of the world were doing. Because remember all the time, they think they're special. They think they're the issue, like, you know, we're, we're God's chosen people. You know, he's not going to do anything bad to us. He's not going to let anything bad happen to us. Oh, he chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us to be his special people. So that's where they felt. That's why they were doing and living and doing all these things they were doing. Because they just knew, you're not going to get rid of all of us. Besides, we're the Davidic line. You know, we're, we're from that side. We're, 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 we're that human Jew. 
We're all here in Jerusalem. We're your people. You got rid of all the Israelites. You got rid of the other 10 tribes, but guess what? We all right. We special. You know? And that's how they were feeling. They had got, that, that's where that arrogance and that pride stepped in. And they felt that, you know, they knew what God had said. And uh, about you know there being a Davidic line on the, on the team, they knew that they were his chosen people, and you're not gonna, you're, you're just not gonna do it. Even though they saw as an example what he did with Israel, you're just not gonna do this because you love us just that much. You know we do that today. We do that today. Lord God, you know you love me. I'm special. I'm special. Like the man, it's like what makes you so special? <laughs> We special. You're not gonna do that. So I'm gonna go over here and do this. Let's see here now. Here, did I you forgive me? Because you did say your word seventy-seven times seven. So just call me an Israelite because I'm gonna do this what I want to do over here. And then you gotta forgive me. But time ran out for these Israelites. Ran out for them. God is right. At this point in time, He had turned His face, not just His back. You know, He had turned His face away from them because this apostasy that they were committing was just so bad. They refused, knowingly, they knowingly refused to repent. They knowingly, they knew they were wrong. They knew what they were doing was wrong. They knew they were worshiping God, and they were also worshiping these other gods, the small g gods, the other deities, the Astaroth, the uh, Baal. They were worshiping the Chemosh. Chemosh is one of those gods, Moloch. Those were the gods that you burn your children up and sacrifice your children. So they had gotten into that practice where they were walking their little kids up to the burnt offering. The, and that's a burnt offering. They were burning their children. So they were walking their children up there and and and, and, and burn them. Let's say, uh, uh, um, <laughs> human sacrifice. So from time to time, that's the days in Ahaz, King Ahaz. He's one of the Israelite kings. That's when it happened. Second King, chapter 16, verse number three, reads, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. This is Ahab. He even made his son pass through fire according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. They had gotten just that bad in following these people. So that's 2 Kings chapter 16, verse number 3. They had gotten just that bad at following these people. And also, that wasn't the only king, Manasseh. No, he went a little crazy too. So <laughs> over in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse number six, it reads, he made his son pass through fire. Mm -hmm. So you had some of those kings were just like, they were way out there. They had just went rogue. Mm -hmm. well, Israel, the Israelites, the Israelites did not burn their children. They did not sacrifice their children. They did not sacrifice people. These people had gotten so bad to where they were doing, they had fallen, and you're going to see that they fall into cannibalism. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's a big step away from God. And this is how bad these folks had died. So this this came, Manasseh made his son walk through uh fire, pass through fire. So this was a practice that God did not approve because verse number five reads, and gone on building the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it enter. My man. So this is Jeremiah speaking on God's behalf in verse number five. God is saying, that didn't come to my man for you all to do that to your children. You know, these are my children. It was an insult to God and a rejection of his soul and total sovereignty over his covenant people. So this constant malicious uh, rejection of God could only result in the operation of the covenant curses. The curses of the covenant would operate in the cancellation of Judah's plan and the destruction of the city and its people. So by now, you know, like I said, God was tired of them. He has tried and he has tried and he has tried. A lot of times, you know, these people were so <laughs> obnoxious or so crazy that they blamed God for their sin. That's just how bad they got. They blamed God for their sin that they knew they were doing. And they had nerve enough to say, Lord, you made me. Because you're gonna forgive me, you know you you made me, you created me, and all that. You knew what I'm gonna do. You know what I was gonna do. But guess what? You chose me. I'm still an Israelite, so you're gonna forgive me, and we're gonna go on, and I'm gonna keep worshiping these these Canaanite gods. 
I'm going to keep living. You know, they were living based on their pleasure, the pleasure that they enjoyed doing. So everybody was doing what they wanted to do. Um, prostitutes, women were prostituted. You know, harlotry, as they called it, harlotry. They were just doing it all. But God is like, okay, hold up. I told y'all, y'all can't do that. But they continued, they continued, they continued to do that anyway. So in verse number six, in verse number six, uh, Jeremiah told his audience of a day that was coming when the place would undergo a change of name from Topheth or the valley of the son of Kenna to the valley of Slaughter. Now on that side, it's supposed to say valley of Slaughter. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> so that was, this, this is like the valley of Slaughter. I didn't want to put two groups on a picture up there. Because I also had found the picture of, of the kids being actually burnt up, and I didn't want to show that. So I just put the burnt offering up there and left that other one off. <laughs> so, so, so this is where that change of name signified a change of function. Genesis chapter 17, verse number five reads, Genesis 17, five, no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestors of a multitude of nations. So when this name change came, that was a significant uh, happening that was about to happen. So they've changed from Topic or the Valley of the Son of Kenan to the Valley of Slaughter. So, oh, that, that high end gets me every time. <laughs> so, but that, that's, I had to find a wild beast and I was trying to find one of the wildest ones I can think of. But I think a, a hyena can even eat. They can kill a lion and they can kill big stuff. You know, hyenas or something. They're like a pack of hyenas. That's what he's describing. So verse number seven says, and in this place, I will make void the plants of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will make them fall by the sword there in, uh, before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the, the, to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth. So I got bird, I got bird of prey and the wild beast. <laughs> but those hyenas, when you get a pack of them coming at you, that's not nice, you know. God would cancel or destroy the plans of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. That's what that verse is that, that God is telling them. And remember, we've already discussed that people, the people's bodies would not be buried once they were slaughtered. They would be food to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth. You know, that was a big, 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 big insult to the Israelites because they believed in, you know, you know, we got the area out there. We can't leave them out here. Well, they were going to end up with just bodies. God is telling them in this that your bodies are just going to be thrown around. They're just going to be there for those, for those animals to get. So they're just going to be there. We saw this before in Jeremiah chapter 7. Verse number 33, that's what we discussed is that chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 33, when it said that the only other place in the Bible outside of Jeremiah that this phrase occurring in is going to be Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse number 26. So you're not, that's, that's the only other place, because that's a, that's a gruesome event. You know, especially, like I said, the Israelites, they buried their dead. They didn't just leave them out like this. So in this occasion right here, then in seven, Jeremiah 7, 33, and uh, uh, the another one was Deuteronomy 28, verse number 26. And then this is Deuteron this is Jeremiah 19, verse number seven. Those are the places where you're, and you're gonna see that. You don't see that, you don't see that phrase. You don't see that often. You don't see it except for those places. So according to verse number eight, Jerusalem itself will suffer severely and become a city of horror and a cause of hissing or whistling, a sight so shock shocking that it will make men whistle as they pass by and observe its uh, uh, yeah, devastation. It's going to be Jerusalem. And remember how beautiful Jerusalem you know, was, was at that time. But now it's going to become a desolate, a desolate place. And it's going to be bad. Well, when you pass by, it's not going to look like Jerusalem at all. It's not going to look like the, the, that beautiful city that was God's own at all. Because he's going to allow the And remember now, <laughs> Israel, the northern kingdom, they were inhabited by, after Assyria took them into captivity, he brought in, they uh, they brought in people. The king at the time was Tegelah Pilaster. 
Tagler, T I G L A T H, Palestra, P I L A T E R, S T E R. Tagler Palestra. He was the, the king back then in Assyria. So when he uh, conquered Israel, the 10 tribes that were the northern tribes, he brought in, because they, they were a big, big, big king, a nation, and they were going around just killing up and beating up all the smaller nations. And then they would take those people captive and bring them. So what he did, and you know, of course, God, God did this because of how bad they had gotten. So they wouldn't repent either. So they should have been an example to Judah. So they wouldn't repent either. So God brought in, let him bring in other people that they had caught, other captives. So they brought in other captives and they filled the 10 nations, the 10, the other 10 tribes. They filled those cities that they had, you know, uh, what, uh, I'm trying to think of all of them right now, but uh, you had Simeon, you had Levites did not have a tribe, you had the Zebulans, you had all those tribes, Issachar, Issachar, so you had all these tribes. They filled all those cities that they had, and in these tribes, in these tribal cities, they filled them out with people that they had taken captive, so foreign people. So now, and remember, this is God's promise land. And you also had the land that was over in the Transjordan. All of that was part of it. They lost all of that because of how of, of, of their their you know them being hard hit a stiff neck and stuff. So they lost all that. So now all we got is Judah. Judah consists of you know uh, Judah uh, and uh, Benjamin. And then you got the half tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh that was there. So that was it. So that's all you got left. So they have all those uh, the Israel 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 is gone. So all we got is Judah. And they had the example and they didn't pay attention to the example. They decided we're, we're, we're going to do what we're going to do because he just loves us. You know, <laughs> that's what Israelites thought too. But that's, that, and so that's the difference, you know. So with, with that land, it was occupied by all these people that they had taken captive. With Judah, God didn't allow that to happen. He allowed the, the, the exile happen back then with Assyria and, and Israel. He also allowed the exile to happen with the Babylonians when they, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, when they came and they got uh, Judah and Benjamin. So that way, remember Judah's one, one, uh, one whole thing. So that's when that happened. That's the difference. The land was not occupied with captives. Instead, God allowed it to remain desolate or destitute. Nobody moved on it. So the land just grew. Uh, with, with weeds and, and, and bush and, and, and whatever else you grow out in the woods. That look like a wooden forsaken wilderness for 70 years because they were gone for 70 years, which would represent Sabbath. They had missed Sabbath 70 times. Yeah, 70 times. So that's why they, were, they, they had to stay away from God's land. So nobody was in that land during that time. So when he allowed them to go back, they had to do some rebuilding and stuff. Now, remember when they first came over, they didn't have to build a thing. They had houses, they had homes, you know, God gave them a land, all of it. It was already, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't even have to grow uh, crops. Everything was there for them. The people there had already cultivated it and all that. But now they got to go back to a barren land that was full of wild animals and all that. Animals didn't attack them when they went back. So God cleared all the out. He took them back home. The whole trip home, and, and like I said, Cyrus is one that let them go back home through God, of course. The whole trip home. Nobody attacked them. No animal attacked them. And that was God. So he made that way for them. So according to verse number eight, Jerusalem itself, like I said, will become a city of horror. So like I said, this beautiful Jerusalem that now is going to be desolate, destitute, you know, for all these years, over 70 years. Uh, was looking really bad. So people passed by and they said, is that Jerusalem? Mm. You know, whatever happened, you know, because, and they knew that it was because, and we saw that last week, the people knew it was because uh, the uh, Israelites, or I want to call them Judeans, were hard-headed and stiff-necked. So even the pagan people around them recognized the fact that you all used to be a beautiful city. You all had it going on when you all had that God behind y'all, that unseen, invisible God that y'all were worshiping and stuff behind y'all. But now, look at you. Mm. <laughs> you know, y'all chose to go with us. Mm. You know, and now look at y'all. Mm. So, yeah, you know, so even the people observed, you know, how it was. In verse number nine, the gruesome curses continue. So, got that in verse number nine. Under the pressure of a siege, the people of Jerusalem would eat the flesh of their sons mm. 
and daughters, and then turn to devouring one another. Oh, y'all, they want to go to cannibalism and stuff up in here. <laughs> so this horrible practice took place in the siege of Samaria during the Armenian War. This is when it happened before. The only time it happened before, it happened over in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 through 29. But this practice was also wild, widely known in the Middle East. But that's when it happened before, over in the, the siege of Samaritan. And you find that at 2 Kings 6, uh, 24 through 29. And so in verses 10 and 11, the time had come for uh, for him to smash that jar, that earthenware jar that he got. Uh, and it didn't look like that when I typed it, that he was up there where it's supposed to be. But Jeremiah, the breaking of the jar was a symbolic act. Remember, I told you, it's full of symbolism. Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, all these prophets, they're full of symbolism. The command to shatter the jar before the eyes of the men that he brought with him. So remember, he only got these officials with him. He's still at that point when he's only brought all these high you know, leaders and positions, uh, not positions, but officials with him. So these are the only people that were with him when he smashed that jar. So, uh, but it didn't restrict the message that he was telling them. So this symbolic act was to all the people of Jerusalem and Judah. So the breaking of the jaw was a symbol of the breaking of the people and the city. It was parallel to the breaking of a vessel by a potter. So the vessel that proved useless was broken into fragments. Once broken, it could not be mended. Now last week when we looked at that potter, when Jeremiah was looking through one of them, looking at him, <laughs> you know, the, the potter would be making a, a, a piece or just using the clay, trying to uh, put it together. And then when he was trying to put it together, if it didn't, if it wasn't right and stuff, he was just remolded. He was just reshaped. Just like God do with us today. Mm -hmm. When something is going on with us and all that, and God sees that it's not right, that it needs to be redone, or when you repent, he can remold you. He can mm -hmm. reshape you. He can refurbish you. He can renew you. He can restore you. So, uh, but this, this once it's gotten so far and, and everything, is that when Jer Jeremiah's like, you all have went as far as God is going is willing to allow you. So he broke that jar. So once broken, it could not be mended. So he's telling Jerusalem and, and Judah, it's too late. Mm -hmm. He's giving you time. He's giving you chance behind chance behind chance behind chance. And you constantly turn your back on him. So at this point in time, it's too late. So a nation which had violated God's purpose for his people was useless. God couldn't do anything for them. There was a purpose. There was a reason why he chose them. He did not chose these people, <laughs> the Israelites, because they were some great, you know, some, some great people. He didn't chose them. Then they were numerous. There were other people that were more numerous than them. So it wasn't because of the number either. You know, God just chose a group of people. Well, actually, he chose them because of Abraham, his righteousness was credited to God. Mm -hmm. So God chose them because of Abraham. That's why he went to Abraham first. But these descendants <laughs> over the years and generations and generations and generations had changed. Just like what it is now. Look at us today. You know, we've changed some things, you know, so even when you think about it, even from your grandparent to you now, changes have been made. So back then, when you go, you know, from back, and, but, and, 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 you know, they live by tradition a lot, you know, even now today over in Israel, when we go, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of tradition. They still wear the same, some of them still wear the same clothes they wore back then, you know, so you're going to see a lot, and then when you go, we went to our, um, Travel, travel agent's house. <laughs> uh, we made a little stop. But we went there. He still lived with his parents, his mom and dad. He still lived there. And the sisters still live there. They all still live together. You know, like they have separate houses, but they all still live together on the land. And it's all like connected to each other. So they're well protected. And we went to the city of David. So this, and he lived in the city of David. So that's how they are. So so tradition, you see a lot of tradition, uh, the Israelite tradition. When you go over there, like this guy, his name is Jacob. He got an uncle named David. You know, they all had biblical names. His whole family, his entire family, you know, got biblical names and stuff. So um, the presence of the corpse, which I got it off of that, made the city unclean. So another reason for the uncleanness was the pollution caused by the pagan worship conducted on the rooftop. They were going on the rooftop of houses. They wanted to be seen. They wanted everybody to see that they were worshiping these gods. That's where the pagan people were. They wanted you to see them worshiping. 
So uh, burnt offerings were often made and stuff. And so, and it was also, <laughs> they considered it was offered to the host of heaven. So that's what the Israelites were doing now. We're offering burnt offerings, you know, unclean offerings to the host of heaven. That's what, that's how they referred to him. Where libations, and libations is an act of pouring liquid as a sacrifice. Nine times out of 10, that was wine. So, you know, they, 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 they were doing their little wine stuff. So, but they were pouring it out to the other gods. They were pointed out to the other gods. So among the Mesopotamian gods, the Astar or Astaroth, uh, that's that person, she's female. And she was very important. Now she represented her, you know, fertility. Uh, and so she was like the fertility god, the god of love, as they call it, fertility god. So Zephaniah chapter one, verse five, refers to this practice where they did this. And it reads, those who bow down on the roots to the host of heaven. So they would do this where they wanted to be seen. Contact with a corpse defiled anything and everything. So, and they were still doing that. Some of these Israelites were still going around, uh, you know, these defiled or these corpses that God would tell them, don't go around this certain one and go do that. They were doing it. They were just doing whatever. You imagine it. Like they said, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> there was nothing new that they were not doing. They were doing it all. So on Jeremiah's return to the city from Tophet, he proceeded to the court of the temple. This meant that the audience in the temple court was no longer just that select group of people that he took. Now he's going to address all the people. Because now that he's going to talk to the leader, and God has given him that and told him, you know, and got them to go with him and he talked to them, now he's going to address the whole entire people. So nobody can say, I didn't know, I didn't hear, I didn't see. He, God is allowing this to happen. So everybody's going to show up and he's going to address the whole people in the temple court. So he's talking there about all the disaster which Jeremiah spoke about on God's behalf would fall upon the city and the neighboring towns. The reason is plain because they had stiffened their necks, refusing to hear my words. That's what God told them. Because you all don't want to hear what I have to say, then this is what's going to befall. This is what's going to come to you all. So, uh, and that was chapter 19. And you see that at the, what I just said at the last verse 15. He said, and this is the reason why, he said, God made it plain right here. Jeremiah broke it down to all the people, mm -hmm. not just to the leaders. And he told them in verse number 15, where he says, you all have stiffened your necks. Y'all are refusing my words. So now I'm going to bring all this down upon the city and all this time. Mm -hmm. So not just one specific person, not just specific people, all of you all, not just a specific town, all of your town, you know, because of how you all, you know, have did. So um, Jeremiah 21 through 6, we're going to wrap it all up. Wrap it all up. This is short and sweet. Jeremiah's preaching in the temple courtyard was heard by that guy called Kashir. His name was Kashir Ben Emar. He's described as the priest, the chief officer. His function was to maintain order in the temple, because he is a priest, and his precinct. And to deal with the troublemakers. That was his job. You know, he's a remember, he's a, he's a ruler. He's a king. You know, he's a priest. So he's one of the elders. He's one of the rulers. Jeremiah himself, you no, know, so when Jeremiah was called, he was appointed to be an overseer of the nation. So the banning of this, but the, the banning of Jeremiah from the temple would have been the work of Pastor. Remember, we read about that before. They banned Jeremiah from even coming to the temple. And so this is the guy that banned him from coming to the temple. Jeremiah 36 and 5 reads, and Jeremiah, so Jer there's always a way around stuff. So Jeremiah ordered Barak. Remember Barak? That was his scribe. When he had a scribe named Barak. Uh, he ordered him, he said, I am prevented from entering the house of the Lord. So he told him, and this is 35, 36, uh, verse number 5, Jeremiah ordered Barak saying, I am prevented from entering the house of the Lord. On that occasion, Jeremiah said Barak, <laughs> or Baroque. Of a root, <laughs> however you say, I don't know if it's a little different, but on that occasion, Jeremiah sent him to read the scroll, and you see that in Jeremiah chapter number 36. So, there's a way around some stuff when God is trying to get you to do something, He's going to give it to you, He's going to give you the path that you need to go on. He's mm -hmm. going to make a way. We always say, The Lord make a way, the Lord, yeah, He's going to make a way, but are you going to follow that way that He leads you that He makes that way for you? That's the thing. <laughs> so, Peshur went into exile. In 597 BC, 
And Jeremiah had prophesied this over in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse number 6. Because the office was held by Zephaniah. Zephaniah, and who Zephaniah is the son of Messiah, uh, M-A-A-S-E-I-A-H. And that happened after 597 BC. So uh, remember, I just told you Jeremiah was punished for prophesying. The punishment involved beating. So he beat him up first. He beat him. Mm -hmm. And you see that at verse number two, it says, Then Peshur struck the prophet, prophet right. being Jeremiah, and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. And then, uh, so he beat him, and then following that beating, he put him in the stocks. The place of confinement, so the place where they kept him was in the upper Benjamin gate, which was a gate to the temple precinct, and it's different from the regular Benjamin gate. That was a gate in the city wall. So there were two different gates that were called the uh, Benjamin Gate. One was upper and one was lower. So um, then when 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 uh, Peshur released Jeremiah, remember I told you he only kept him overnight. So he released him the next morning. Jeremiah gave him the symbolic name uh, Megar Misabia. And it stands for a terror all around. Yeah, Megar Misabia. And it means terror all around. That's what that name is. So the name had been used earlier over in, we saw it in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 25, and it was about the relentless enemy, talking about that enemy that was coming from the north. And we know now that the enemy from the north was, of course, Babylon. And remember, even though they were coming from the north, because Babylon was up north, the enemy surprised them by coming in from the south. At this time, while Jeremiah is speaking and screaming and hollering and saying, y'all listen to me, the Lord, thus says the Lord, the Babylonians was already coming in from the south attacking them. Mm. So they were already being attacked because the attack had started at this point. Jeremiah, like I said, the Lord said, I'm through. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm through these people. So he let the uh, attack begin. So Jeremiah, even with this going on, Jeremiah was still trying to convince them. Come on, y'all, let's repent. Jeremiah, you know, he never gave up. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet mm -hmm. because he knew of this coming disaster that was coming upon his people. He wasn't crying because he just wanted to cry. He was crying because of what was he knew, the wrath that he knew was going to come upon them. He knew the disaster, you know. And, God, and, he, and the thing about it, he's telling these people, and they're not listening. So he's not crying just to make tears and just to wet his face up and all that. He's crying for them. Because of what was about to happen to them. And he knew that the, you know, the disaster, because God was telling him about these wild animals. And I remember at one point they were going to have snakes coming in. So they're going to have all this stuff. So Jeremiah is saying, You all just do not believe in or understand the wrath of God that's coming your way. Mm -hmm. So he's praying and he's crying. So he's praying and crying, praying and crying, praying and crying. So he became known as the weeping, you know, prophet. Not because of anything that he's done or because of himself. Remember, he even went to God, look, Lord, what are those confessions? Look, Lord, you know, I'm doing everything you asked me to do. You know, I'm doing everything. Why I got to go into an exile with them? Because remember, even he was <laughs> like, Lord, why me? Why, you know, that reminds me of the sermon. Why me? You know, why me? So Jeremiah had no one of those why me moments. He had them too. So, so uh, when, like I said, that that when he released him and all that, but Pasher, being Emmer, he would not be a temple overseer who gives out punishment to others, but one who will himself suffer the divine judgment when terror surrounds him in the nation. So as bad as he was, and as mean as he was, and as, you know, as, as he was a he he was not a great leader. But all of this was going to turn around on him. Jeremiah then revealed the meaning of the new name, and God would make Peshur a terror to himself and also to his allies. So he had friends that were helping him. His new name was a curse upon him. Who would be caught up in the terror, which would descend upon, upon Jews. So even though he was walking out of bad stuff that happened with his with, with his people, he was a priest. With, you know, with them, he was he was dishing it out. But now God was going to dish it back to him. Mm -hmm. So he was going to reap some of this stuff that he was putting out on the other people. All this oppression that he was doing, that these leaders were doing. You know, you know some of, when we read about some of them, it always came back on them. What is that? You reap what you sow. Mm. So the exact same thing that he was doing to them, he and his political, his friends, him, <laughs> he and his political allies were going to suffer. He would see many fall by the sword, 
and many handed over to the king of Babylon for deportation. So the same thing that he was trying to do to them was going to happen to him. The enemy from the north was no longer a mystery. Now they knew for sure who was coming. So now they realized. Jeremiah was telling them, but the only thing Jeremiah used to say is an enemy from the north, an enemy from the north. That's all he was saying, an enemy from the north. But now they know it's going to be Babylon. And they were scared because Babylon was, 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 was huge. Yeah. They were scared. But then, you know, later on, we're going to see a bigger army come in and get them. That's going to be Persia. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're going to call, you know, y'all heard of uh, Esther and King of Durses and all that. That's what they fought in later on. But uh, <laughs> the prophecy was made before 597 BC because Jeremiah had already spoke all this and all that. And so these people were taking all the wealth, they were taking all their possessions, they were taking all their belongings, their valuables, and they were taking all their treasures. Mm -hmm. So when they come in, you know how war went. You know, so and, and remember, they're also killing men, women, children, babies. They were killing everything that was coming. That's why Jeremiah was crying so much. He knew what was going, what was about to uh, take place for them. So, Hashir's personal judgment would be deportation with his family to a land where he would die and be buried, along with his allies to whom he prophesied falsely. That's what he was known like. But he was not merely a priest, but he was also a prophet. He was one of those top prophets, one of those who had declared that no harm would come upon the nation. Y'all remember those, those prophets that they had, those false prophets they had. These were people that were in those positions, those leadership positions. They knew that they were wrong. They knew that what they were saying was the lie. When we call it the lie. They would tell these people that, oh, in the future, we're going to have peace. We're going to have less than prosperity. All you got to do is follow me. You know, just believe what I'm saying. This is what we're going to have. This is what we see in our future. Forget about what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is the one that's telling the lie. But all the time, they did, they saw it for themselves because they were taken from the people. So they were lying. They were labeled as the lie. That's what Jeremiah labeled them as, the liars. So this is their lie. And, and Jeremiah was telling the people, beware of them. They're coming to you with, you know, as wolves with sheep, uh, wearing sheep clothing. But that was the lie that, 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 uh, that uh, it was worthy of death. Because they were lying to God's people. These people were helping them stay, uh, keep up living the ways that they were living. They were oppressing the people, but they were continuing. They were leading them uh, the wrong way. They were leading them to live, you know, this life. Judah's leaders, prophets, priests, wise men, and kings. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, I like this. What's going on right today? Right. Like, that's what's going on today. It, it, like we just said, there's nothing new oh, under the sun. We hadn't invented anything. Uh, All of this was going on back in this in, in their time. Lord. And remember, and, and remember every day they, they would bring up, they would bring up uh the, the Moses. They would bring up what the forefathers had did. They talked about it. So God was like, I'm doing a new thing now. You know, we're doing this new thing. Don't forget about the old stuff. But we're doing a new thing as well. So you just, you know, you build on that. But don't just live it because they lived it. You know, they did what they had to do. Now you got to do, but you got to, you can't forget it. But you got, we got to build on it. You know, we got to build on it. So yeah, you're right. It, it's, it's like the same stuff that's going on today. People are still stiff necked and hard headed, you know, and, and stuff. And then you have to wonder, when will God tell us? Stop praying for those people. They refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. And we see that it happened. We can't say it won't happen because it happened with his own people that he chose. So we can't get so big headed that we think, oh, it'll never happen with us. God loves me so much. Yeah. And we, we say that's our Jesus loves me. I know we know that. He do. He loves you. He loves you so much. He don't want to see your house to get wood. God said, enough is enough. He said, enough is enough. And he's going to finally say that to us one day. Enough is enough. I just can't do it anymore. I have talked to you all. I have told you all. And that is what he's doing. He begged. We, we've come along, and we're at just chapter 19, but we saw it even in Isaiah. How he begged these people. He said, God is doing the begging and the pleading for these people. And they still refused to turn around. And they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing was wrong. They knew. It, it's not like, you know, it's something that they just, oh, I wake up the next day and, 
uh, somebody tells me this, this had been embedded in them and talked to them since they were young coming up. So they knew. Just like some of us say, we know. But that pleasure, you know, because when you think about what they were doing, they, they were actually, the temple prostitutes were in, there was prostituting in the temple, in God's house. You know, they put the, move the stuff of God, move the things of God to the side. And then they would do it not only in the temple, but remember the high places. This chapter mentions the high places. The high places because they wanted everybody to see them, even on, to the point of on top of roof, on rooftop. But usually the high places, when we go to Israel, you will go to some high places. We're going to take you there. God told them way back when to tear all the high places down. You tell the high places down, guess what? They won't be going up there worship. So not only were they going in the high places, they were always also going into some of the low valleys because they wanted people to see them. People would pass through those low valleys and see them. And then they would be up on the high places you saw them. And all the time they were worshiping the Baals and worshiping at the rock. They were doing all that and they wanted people to see them. So what they <laughs> knew was not only what people were seeing, but God was seeing and they would also do burnt offerings for their defiled and God. They're burning their children up. So they're being in defiance. So on these high places, that's what they were doing. They were, they were, you know, actually doing children sacrificing. That's why God said, tear them down. Now you had some kings that Davidic kings, mind you, that would tear the places down. But you had a lot of them that didn't. So they uh and, and remember, like I told you last week, how they were supposed to come to Jerusalem to the temple to worship, or uh, uh, once a year to uh, uh, come and worship and stuff. They stopped uh, doing that uh, at Passover time. They stopped. They started going to Dan and Bethel. You know, uh, it's bad enough that Israelites, Israel had did. But when you're living in Jerusalem, when you're living right there, and the temple is right there, <laughs> right with you, and you leave that Jerusalem, and you go to Dan or you go to Bethel, those were the two places they had set up the high places at this point in time. You would rather leave Jerusalem and go to those places where Israel used to come because the king then had told them, oh, you don't have to go all the way to Israel. Just make a stop. Dan and Bethel, we set them up. You don't have to go all the way to Israel. And that's what they did. So now these people are doing the same thing. But they leave Jerusalem and go. So that's how, that's just how bad it was with them and how they had, you know, come to their worship. So, and then they were like, how do you think, how do you going to fool God? I'm going to go again, I'm going to worship over here, but then I'm going to go get to the temple and I'm going to do a little worship. Like, God well, didn't know it was there. And that's what they were doing. So, yeah, anyway, any questions or comments on tonight's lesson? Well, it's ironic that all this stuff is going on now. And two years in high places, yeah. rain down high places to low places. Exactly, exactly. He is. He really is. Um. Any other questions or comments? And he is. I don't know why they think that he don't see. He knows it all. He's the God that knows everything. Why they think that he don't see and he don't know? And they still trying. And they just doing whatever. They think it's okay to just live and do whatever they want to do. You know. And, and we're all sinners, you know, we come short and all that, but still, you know, you still have to ask for repentance. You still have to believe, you still have to trust and know that he is God. But uh, the stuff that people are doing, it makes you wonder what is wrong with that person. But that person really, and you know, you cannot say, you cannot say the devil made you do it. But the devil don't make you do everything that you do. The devil don't make you do everything that you do. It is the desires of our heart that will make us do it. <laughs> the devil may make you do one thing, yeah. but that strong desire in your heart, yeah. because it's what's in your heart that, that that's important. What's in your heart? So that strong desire that you be wanting to do something, it's like the devil all the time. That's you. You want to do what you want to do versus doing what God wants you to do. And you know what? From the beginning, we've always blamed somebody. Adam and Eve, remember that? Adam blame, Eve blame, and then the snake, you know. So you've always they've always wanted to blame somebody. They don't want to take the blame. We're the same way. I don't want to take the blame for that. So guess what? This is my strong desire, but I'm gonna blame the devil. The devil made me do it. You know, so that's what we do. So anyway, next week Bible study will be Jeremiah chapter 20. So until next time, be blessed by God, be a blessing to others, be a person of God, share your love, share your faith.
share God's word, and share the blessings that you receive from God with others each and every day. Amen. 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 Amen.